up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. No, it's Jeff Peters from Commuter Comics. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And I don't subject, guarantee I'll be flying. Uh, well, you know, I, it, we're going to fly out of here. Uh, we're going to talk about comic books and all about uh, rare comic books, action superheroes. It's going to be a great show. Jeff, how did you start collecting comics? How did it all start for you? Well, my dad collected comics uh, long before I ever came along, before I was even a twinkle in his eye. Um, he, the, the apocryphal story goes that he, uh, when he went into World War II, my grandparents cut. He was a big fan of Little Abner, which was a strip by Al Cap, a political satire strip in the, uh, <clears throat> in the 40s and went all the way up through like 72. And when he was in the war, uh, they clipped, the, they clipped the, uh, the daily strip out and saved them for him so that when he got back, he could read them all. And then he continued to collect them. Uh, and he also read Pogo, and he read uh, Pogo Possum by Walt Remember Kelly. Remember that well. And he read uh, another political satire, and uh, and he read Mad, more political satire. So that was, uh, he had that, and my older brother collected, and he was into all the, the superheroes and the, the stuff that was coming out uh, in the 50s and 60s is what he had, um, which was... Uh, Mostly the Superman, Batman, Justice League, a uh, lot of um, stuff from Dell that was based on television series like The Rifleman and that kind of thing. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Walt Disney's comics and stories, uh, the big Dell giants, which were thick, thick books for 25 cents, and you'd get like 100 pages of stories, um, Huckleberry Hound and mm. uh, uh, Yogi Bear and all that kind of stuff. Um, so when I started... Uh, they would all read them, and uh, and I actually learned to read by reading Peanuts in the what? in the Sunday paper. I would read the funnies. After my dad was finished, he would give us the funnies. We'd go into the living room, we'd lie down, and that's how I figured out how to read. So it kind of ran. It kind of runs in the family. We all have read comics at some point in time. And so you learned. You had fun at the same readers. time. Absolutely, it's comics are a blast. Yeah. Now, yeah. my, my, my next question is, how did comic books happen? I mean, I've, I've heard stories. It was the, the caveman who had things on the wall, hieroglyphics. Yeah. These were the first attempts that comics had, but it well, was a real first time. Comics, art, uh, comics are generally a, a mixture of word and pictures, is what they say. So um, the, that has been going on. I mean, hieroglyphics really were words and pictures together. Right. Uh, so as far back as the Egyptians. Um, there are other things before that, or, you know, the, the caveman wall is, is a place to begin. But really, they started getting put together in, um, I'm not sure about the exact dates, but in France they uh, and, and England, they started doing the picture with the words underneath um, as plates, uh, the rake's progress, that kind of thing. You see these... Uh, uh, the start of that in art. Um, a fellow named Rudolf Toffler would, uh, would actually do a drawing and then words underneath and tell a little story. Um, and that is considered the beginning of the comic strip. Was this a comic nature or was it a serious nature? Oh, no, nature? They, were, they were comic nature. Or a I mean, satire of most the times? Of, yeah, most of it comes out of a political, political <coughs> satire, political cartooning. That's what it was. I mean, here in the U.S., it's pretty much considered Ben Franklin's Unite or Die with the mm -hmm. pictures of the of the snake chopped up with the, all the states written on it right. is considered the first political cartoon and that is literally words and pictures used together um, so that was the beginning of it here and then it, it, it grew into more editorial cartoons uh, they've, they've constantly been done throughout history when, whenever there's a a politician involved, there's always somebody drawing a caricature of them and then having them say exactly. something ridiculous or stupid. Um, uh, and some, most of the times it's a quote. Um, but uh, that grew into the, the comic strip form that we, knew, that we know now. Right. Um, William Randolph Hearst was doing <laughs> political cartoons in his newspapers. They developed a color printing process which led to the beginning of the comic strip character called the Yellow Kid. Right, that and was the first. Right, was generally considered to be the first ongoing comic 
strip character. Even you know, it was though like about 1896 player. that it came out. That's right. We're talking a long time ago. That's right. It's over, you know, over 100 years ago. So, I mean, 100 and, 110 if you want to get yeah. <laughs> technical wow. about it. Sometimes so, I feel 110. Yeah, so I, yeah, really I, I hear you. Um, but that, after Yellow Kid, it led into a, there was a, a, a giant explosion because from Yellow Kid, other characters and, and s little story strips, the, what, what we know as comic strips in the newspaper, uh, are, uh, now began to develop and began to be merchandised. And as people saw, oh, there's ancillary money to be made off of these, let's start creating more. And many, many artists went into it. Windsor McKay developed Little Nemo. Uh, that was the Little Nemo in Slumberland, where each he would have a dream each time and wake up at the falling out of bed at the end. Uh, there are the brownies and uh, the gumps and life with father and, and on and on. And during the 30s there were a huge amount of them. Uh, and the, the, they, well, they were, they were there in, the, in the, the tens, the teens, the twenties, the thirties. The thirties they began to branch out into um, adventure strips. You have to pardon no, you're me. Beeping, my, huh? my phone. Get excited I'm over a very those popular comic books, fellow. Don't you? I'll yeah. tell you. Um, I want to buy them now. The, uh, the uh, uh, and in the adventure strips, you got things like uh, Mickey Mouse and Flash Gordon and uh, oh, yes. uh, the, the the I want to say the Lone Ranger, but I don't think that's right. Popeye, um, these characters, Tarzan, that had developed into comic book strips, into comic strips, and comic books came about because the fellows that had the uh, that were printing the comics, the the Sunday funnies basically found that they had paper left over at the end of their print run on a Sunday. And they said, what can we do with it? And somebody said, well, you know, and, and now the, the newspapers were about this big at that time. <coughs> and so they said, well, you know, if we fold this, we can get something that's about that size. Clever. And if we Clever. print a cover on it and stuff inside, then we can just reprint these Sunday things because we already have the plates for them and everything. So we'll... Uh, we'll print those and see if anybody buys them. We'll charge a dime and see if anybody will, will buy them. And at the same time, there were things like the big little books which had come out all during the 30s. And they, anybody that was on uh, uh, radio or film at the time had these, little, these big little books. And animation had, had taken off in the 20s and 30s. Uh, so you had Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck were, were around and, um, and the Warner Brothers stuff. And they began to make these big little books which were about this big and on one side would be text, on the other side would be a, a picture. And the whole, the whole book is that way. Text and picture, text and picture, text and picture. And uh, all done with popular characters. And kids were paying a dime for these books. It was a lot of money back then. It was, a, was a lot of money. I mean, you know, a loaf of bread was a nickel. I know. You know, so a dime was a lot for entertainment. And a movie was, you know, uh, where you'd go in to see a movie was a nickel or a dime. And you'd get a cliffhanger and a cartoon and a newsreel and then mm. your, your B feature and then the feature picture. Exactly. You know, so it was a huge amount of entertainment. You'd literally get four or five hours of entertainment in a movie theater with that dime. But from the comic strips, they, they tried it, uh, packaging them in booklet form. Mm. And they had, ar they had also been packaging them in books and they'd been big sellers. And so when they tried it just as a paper form, and it sold, it was called Funnies on Parade, and they tried it, and it sold big time. Wow. And uh, <coughs> they had tried it also as gas station giveaways at uh, Standard oh, Oil. Really? Standard Oil did a whole bunch of them where they reprinted Mutt and Jeff, and they reprinted wow. the Gumps and Life with Father and that kind of thing. Um, and it took off. And they so they started printing these uh, these collections of of the comic strips, which led somebody to the bright idea of hey, what if we do original characters and sell original comics, which is when new funnies came out and they were new stories that were based on the comic strip characters, and then in about 19, uh, 1938, um, they. Uh, Publishing company said national periodical publications said, "You know what? Let's uh, we we've got these guys. They've got this hero. Let's put together a book. It's all, it'll be all new things, 
and see if we can sell that. And Action Comics was born. And that, and that was, was Superman. That was Superman. And that's the original Action Comic number one. Well, this is not an original. Well, not this, the original, this but this it's the reprint. original this look. This is what it looked yeah. like. The original Action Comics number one in near mint condition is there's an offer out there uh, for a million dollars. A million dollars yes. for the original. If you want to see a couple of Action Comics number one, I, I recommend you go down to Baltimore. There's a museum called Jeppy's Entertainment Museum. Hmm. Uh, and he has at least two copies of it sitting there, Boy. along with all the things that I'm talking about here, too. Every major comic that came along. How many in existence of uh, Superman number one? That's a, I, I personally don't know. Uh, they, they have tracked them. I think there are maybe a dozen. Uh, you know, uh, known to exist. It's a, it's an extremely rare book at this point, because what was going on in 1938? You had these comics. They were printed on pulp paper. Uh, but the war effort was to begin shortly, mm. within two, two or three years, and there were paper drives. So they wanted kids to do uh -huh. paper drives, and even on the fronts <coughs> of the comics, they would say, "Help us with the paper drive. Have a paper drive. Buy war bonds." The superheroes were all selling that stuff within wow. a few years. And so the kids would go, I need paper. I need to be patriotic. Where do I find? Oh, I got this big stack of comics. I'll take those and give them to the paper drive. And so the comics from the <coughs> certainly before the war years and after the war years are very difficult to find because the kids would read them wow. and then they'd donate them. Um, but after Superman, th there became a, there was a, a plethora. This he was Superman was the first superhero, and Action Comics is considered the first superhero comic, as opposed to guys like Flash Gordon or Tarzan, you know, who were simply men who were either in the future or uh, in the jungle or that sort of thing. But they were just guys. He was an alien from another planet. He could fly. Well, he could leap originally and then could fly, but he had X-ray vision and super Pretty strength. Good deal. He was, more, he was science fiction is what it was. And the pulps had all grown, too, with science fiction and mystery and that kind of thing. Now, were there other publishers who tried to copy Superman? There were, in fact. And from, what happened? Uh, well, uh, Marvel went, and then Wiz went, and uh, Wiz developed uh, Sh Captain Marvel. You can hold Marvel. that up, right, yeah. Uh, Captain Marvel, take who's take also Shazam, and if you see the two of them... Yes, a big resemblance. You'll <laughs> see that they're pretty close. Um, and... Out of Shazam, DC ended up, DC Comics, which is what who published Action Comics and who they are today, ended up um, suing uh, Wiz Comics, Fawcett, and they stopped publishing the character. Wow. Yeah. And that was uh, in the, in the mid-40s, but there were many, many superheroes that came out in the 40s. You had Batman, you had Flash, uh, there was uh, uh, Mar Marvel Comics came, which was published originally by a company called Timely, mm. and became Marvel. And uh, they had Human Torch, the Submariner, Captain America, because very, very quickly they were all fighting in the war. Terrific illustrations. I mean, the illustrations are just unbelievable. Yeah. And I imagine a lot of movies were a result of comic books, like Superman became a serial. Yep. They became, Batman became a serial. Yep. I guess that they all attribute Marvel that pretty much serial, to the comic Black books. Black became a serial. Yeah, very much so. Comics, uh, since their inception, uh, and comic strips have always been. Uh, inspiration for film, television, radio shows. Uh, Actually, we're going to have to take a break right okay. now. I can't believe it's halfway through the show. Are we? But we're going to be <laughs> we're back. We're only after the 40s. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be back in a few minutes. And uh, if you have a comic book while you're waiting, read the comic book. And uh, don't touch that dial. We'll see you in just a little while. Yeah, what's up, baby? Wanna learn some history? Check it out, check it out. We your GED right here, guaranteed, ma. Huh? Hey, how you doing? Educational videos, top quality, right here. I got live learning, beautiful books inside. The National Center for Family Literacy. Yo, I got your arithmetic right here. Because you can't get your GED on the street. Call 1-877-FAMLIT1 for free learning programs like GED and family computer classes. What is a high school diploma, huh? The National Center for Family Literacy. The first step to a better life. Begin. You are mine, mine. Chicken. McGruff here. If a bully is bothering you, play it smart and try to talk it out. Or get away and tell an adult. 
Well done. For more tips right from my new free comic activity book, play it smart and help take a fight out of crime. And we are back. I can't believe we're halfway through the show. Was DC the first serious publisher of comics? I mean, how, what were this, the lines of different publishers? DC, Marvel, Pretty much. DC Dark was Horse. DC, uh, not known as DC, but now known as DC, because they've all changed publishing. Oh, they have. But they were one of the, ver they were one of the very first uh, serious publishers of comic books. Um, what's now known as Marvel was, was right in there. There were a whole bunch mm. of them, all during the uh, 50s and the 60s. And at that point, it, during the 50s and 60s, um, Comics spanned every possible genre, from mystery to romance to funny animals to superheroes to science fiction, horror, uh, any kind, anything that anybody would read, any uh, subsection you'd find in Barnes & Noble or Borders today, uh, there were comics that dealt with that. But uh, in, the mid in the middle of the 50s, there were uh, Senate hearings that, uh, that were done because of a, a man... Um, named Wortham, who wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent. And mm. the comic strips and the comic books were brought before Congress and asked to defend themselves. Really? And at that point in time, the comics code uh, was, was imposed upon the, the, the publisher self-imposed this code. And, um, and, ba and that's when a lot, of the, a, a lot of the stories, which have become more and more mature and more and more adult as the years went by, uh, then began to disappear. Because there was... There was a real misconception that comics were just for kids, but really, people of all ages were reading them, and that's why there was such a, a breadth of them. After the McCar uh, not McCarthy, but the um, after the Senate hearings, um, uh, they comics went a different direction, and they became mostly the superhero comics that we know today, um, much tamer, uh, and that was through most of the '60s and the '70s. Where, where the comic code was was put on comics. It's Does that still exist today? The comic code. The comic or, code or exists, but a few, a few years ago, Marvel um, Marvel decided to stop using the code because what would happen is they would all take every month they'd have to take their books and they'd pay a fee to the code um, to check their books and then and then put the stamp on it. And Marvel decided, you know, we don't want to pay this fee anymore. And we want to publish books that aren't bound by the code. So rather than doing another imprint or something like that, they just went, they just stopped putting it on. They said, we're going to implement our own uh, ratings, for all ages, for, you know, for teens, for older teens, for mature readers, that kind of thing. Um, but the code is still used. Still used today. It is still used, yeah. It, it doesn't have as much weight and as power uh, as it did during the 60s and 70s. Do they have like PG-13 comics or... or a, there are a comics, rated? there are triple X rated comics. There are triple X. I mean, it, it goes from there down to what we call, you know, mature, which is more, much more graphic violence and language um, and sexuality, and then down to more of the teen uh, general audience, which is 10 to 16, 17, 18. And then there's the all ages stuff, which is good for anybody. Uh, and there are many of them that are still all ages. Things like Donald Duck, Bone is one of my favorites, Uncle Scrooge, The Simpsons. Um, uh, both Marvel and DC do Spider Man, Batman, Justice League, Avengers, Fantastic Four, Teen Titans, uh, for a younger audience. As opposed to the regular books, there's the regular Batman, the regular. Uh, Teen Titans, Superman, Spider-Man are a little more intense and not necessarily something you want to give to a right. you know a four-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old who's just learning how to read. Wasn't there something I remember with Superman? It was uh, uh, Jenny Siegel, Joe Schuster, where the people who wrote Superman are correct. They were and they were the creators. It was something to do with royalties. They were cheated yeah. out of royalties. What happened? That was kind of an interesting. Well, story. because it was all work work for hire, uh, they made a bunch of money off of it originally but then they they actually stopped the the company stopped hiring them to actually write their own character so many years right. went by and uh, a fellow named Neil Adams who um, worked with Denny O'Neill and recreated Green Lantern recreated Batman in the 70s after the Batman TV show which made all comics look pop yeah. and campy uh, Denny O'Neill and uh, and Neil Adams started uh, Okay, we have Batman. We can Detective. hold Detective. This was their fir the uh, 
is a replica of their first issue. And uh, to turn him into more of a Dark Knight, a loner, the detective, right. you know, bring him back to the, the roots from the, the, the 40s that made him such a popular character. But he, Neil Adams stood up for those, uh, for those artists and said, look, they created this character. They're, they're destitute now because it, now it was the early 80, late 70s, early 80s. And he said, you know, these guys are not living well, and you've made millions, if not billions, of dollars off of licensing and publishing this character for all these years. Don't you think they should get paid something? And there was a big battle. The artists came, and they went to D.C., and D.C. fought, and there was all kinds of things that happened. But the bottom line was, uh, the end result, rather, was that um, Siegel and Schuster in every Superman book now have, it always says Superman created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, and they get their rights, and their, or their family gets their rights. So toward the twilight of their life, they were actually taken That's good. care of. Yeah. Are much of the original creators still alive today, or uh, have most of them passed? The, from the stuff from the 40s, not a lot. But Stan Lee is still around, who, who did the whole resurgence of uh, the Marvel characters, which started in the 60s. That's Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, the re the um, uh, the re uh, in reinvention of Captain America, reinvention of of Namor the Submariner, of the Human Torch, putting him as part of the Fantastic Four. Stanley's still alive and kicking. He just had a big thing on uh, the oh, Sci-Fi Channel. He's writing comics. There are a whole bunch of Stanley comics coming out now, where he meets Spider-Man and meets Doctor right. Strange and is meeting all these people. So he still writes comics. He writes. He has his own. Uh, company and so a lot of the creators are still around but some of them are starting to pass away yeah. we we uh will eisner who is a, a real mover and shaker he created a character called the spirit he did the blackhawks for a while um he just he actually created the first graphic novel he was the one that said hey instead of just taking the comics and putting them together in books like this why don't we write a comic that's a full book and it's called contract with god and he was the one that did the very first book, you know, graphic novel, written, uh, a comic written specifically to be a novel. And I mean, the graphics the one that are, came up are with the graphic incredible. Novel. I yeah. mean, uh, you, know, uh, you know, are there, how, tell us about some of the graphic artists who are responsible for some of these wonderful illustrations. I mean, they're just Well, they're, they're you know, men like Jim Steranko, who brought pop art to, uh, pop art to the, to, um, uh, to comic books in the 60s and 70s. Um, they're just I amazing, incredible artists. I mean, right now they're tremendous guys working in the field. Um, but there's the penciler, guys like Jim Lee and George Perez, who are the superstars. But so many other people work on the book. Uh, you have the inkers and the colorists and the... Uh, um, the, the that and the editors that go in and excuse me, for some reason I'm I'm peeping. You're a popular up guy. Somebody's <laughs> somebody's telling me to uh, <laughs> buy more comic books. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somebody's calling in and saying, you know, why isn't the store open? Um, but uh, there's an incredible amount of people that that do the design on these books. I imagine that make them many many amazing. people. And over the years now with technology the way it is, you there, people learn how to be a graphic artist and then go into comic books you know so they they're they're bringing all this uh, visual style from other mediums into into play now i know you have a store in south orange commuter comics mm -hmm. and tell me is investing in comics a, a good thing to do today as far as uh, an investment i imagine i think you know some I of the prices are i know you showed me one that was six or seven hundred dollars so yeah I'm, actually let's I, take a look at that this is uh <laughs> where is it this is a copy of X-Men number one, and uh, now this is not in very good shape. Comics generally run from poor to near mint. Mm. Uh, near mint is an absolutely <laughs> perfect, here, excuse You're me for just one public, moment. You're a public, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> comics run from uh, poor to near mint. Right. And this book is basically in good pores without a cover, right. big chunks taken out of it. This one has a lot of water damage on it, but this this X-Men in Near Mint is worth about $15,000. $15,000? Yes, this particular one's worth about uh, worth about six hundred. dollars Wow. Um, in the shape that it's in. Now, a book like, again, Action Comics number one, this reprint, even though it's from uh, 1988, 
is still worth nine dollars. It was cost fifty cents at the time. But if you actually had the first printing of Action Comics number one in near mint condition, uh, which means there's no marks, there's no creases, there's no nicks, there's nothing missing, nothing missing, nothing, nothing missing. missing. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of myth, but nothing missing. Um, uh, that book, the Action Comics number one, would be worth, as I say, about a million dollars. So you can the the when collecting books, the better the condition, the right. faster it's going to go up in value. I imagine. So you want books that are in absolute near mint condition. I know Nicholas Cage is a big comic Nicholas book collector. Nicholas Cage was a big collector. He's really into the anime. He's really into the comics. He he gathered a lot of... He's, he's going to be in Ghost Rider, and he has a big tattoo of Ghost Rider. Oh, he it, does? And that they had, actually had to CG... And that's a true comic out, book collector. They had to, they had to take How many tattoos out of the movie. do you have, Jeff? I don't that's have any <laughs> tattoos and no piercings either. <laughs> <laughs> um is not my style <laughs> uh but uh he had it he had amassed a, a big collection he sold his collection recently for 1.6 million yep, i believe yep that's, he had a lot of incredible. a lot of actions a lot of supermans that kind of thing the things that he purchased when he was i think being considered to be in the superman movie years ago that uh, tim burton was going to do i imagine comics are great research reflecting the culture of our society if you just go through comics it's it's just it's a wonderful the best time of them are the best of them are i mean uh as I say, they started as political cartoons. Uh, I mean, they started as a method of communication, but really the, the form came out of satire and political satire and, uh, and commentary. And the best of them still do that. Marvel's doing a thing now called Civil War, which is reflecting what's going on. They're, they're mirroring with the superheroes what's going on uh -huh. with, uh, in our own society in terms of the gulags, the, you know, um, making people register, uh, tracking, hunting people down, calling any superhero who doesn't register a terrorist, and dealing with them much wow. in the same manner that our government is. And so it's a very popular book. So that's a future collectible. what's going on. Oh, yeah. Even now. In 20 or 30 years, you could do Well, even now, the problem. prices on that are starting to go up. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about retire, but your whole collection, yes. You, eventually down the road, if you hold on to them and keep them in good shape, you can sell them for a, a tidy profit. We've got about 30 seconds to go. So uh, Read comics. They're a lot of fun. Read comics. That's, it's a know, lot of fun. Uh, uh, it's great having you on the show. Thanks. And Commuter Comics South Orange, mm -hmm. for a Nostalgia or, uh, Alley audience, would it be free appra appraisals? Free appraisals? Free appraisals for yes, our audience? If, if they, they can if bring they in mention, Superman number one. If they, they mention, mention Nostalgia name? Alley. Okay. And, and your name. All right. They have to say your name. All right. Good. That sounds <laughs> good. This is Mike Sobel saying it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And I'd like to say goodnight to you, you, and especially to you. Today we teach a great new dance, don't think that I brag.